Recognized, Emily of Arden, D, 1, 2. Recognized, Joe Moniak, D, 0, 5. Hello, team, and welcome to Scream Something, Volume 16. My name is Emily, and I'm here with my co-host, Producer Neil. Hey, everybody. In Scream Something, a little lot. Words. I wasn't ready for words. In Scream Something, Emily and I will be sharing our initial thoughts and reactions for the episodes of Season 4 that were released last Thursday. There will be plenty of Aster in these episodes, but our team will be saving our deeper analysis for the full episode breakdown that we have planned for after the season finale. Okay, maybe if I believe you're solid. <laughs> okay, then. Tell you what, I'll believe you're alive if you believe I'm alive. Deal? And with all of that out of the way, let's hand it over to Emily for... Hello, Megan! The titles of this week's episodes are Nautical Twilight, Ebb Tide, and Emergency Dive. The release date was March 31st, 2022. The in-episode dates were March 26th, April 19th through 21st, May 14th through 15th, and June 1st through 2nd. A lot of time covers. The directors for this week's episodes were Vinton Hoik, Christina Soda, and Christopher Berkeley. The writers were Maycat, Greg Weissman, and Brandon Vietti. Just in time for your next mission. The mid-season premiere opens with that silent scene from Tale of Two Sisters of Nightwing and Calder informing Artemis of Connor's death. We then cut to almost a month later as Dick and Calder discuss grief and mourning on the Watchtower, and despite encouragement to take a mental health break, Calder insists that he needs to keep working, especially since there's apparently a conference happening in Poseidonus tomorrow. And at the bottom of the ocean, we see a surprisingly alive Ocean Master thanking one of his henchmen for their loyalty. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> the next day, we see the opening ceremonies for that conference Calder mentioned, where delegates from each of the Atlantean city-states have gathered to discuss the current super complicated and fraught political landscape of Atlantis. And with the meeting adjourned, all the Atlanteans head off for a night on the town, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and somewhere deep in space, or outside of both space and time, we're not really sure just yet, a ghostly Superboy wakes up having no idea what happened to him after the bomb exploded and finds the unconscious, equally ghostly form of Phantom Girl. A little later, at an algae bar in Atlantis, a fight nearly breaks out between several of the delegates as the political problems facing Atlantis are fleshed out with references to the season one tie-in comics. We'll get into it. Meanwhile, in Happy Harbor, Violet Harper, Maria Dow, Gabrielle's mother, and the two, uh, and the two of them have a conversation about how she and Samad are doing, as well as Violet asking Maria to teach them about Islam, a conversation that continues throughout the rest of the episode. Back in Atlantis, the conference is going poorly. Atlantis is facing everything from economic inequality to infighting between city-states to pollution and climate change. But before any agreements or solutions can be reached, the conference and, Atlant and Poseidonus at large is attacked by Ocean Master. But out in space, Connor and the unconscious body he is named Ghostly follow an infrared heat signature across the asteroid field they're stranded in. In Poseidonus, the battle rages on until a mysterious hooded figure arrives and defeats Ocean Master, leaving everyone questioning what just happened. <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> Episode 15 opens in Metropolis, where Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy confront Clark Kent in Bibbo's Diner to ask for help. <laughs> What are secret identities? Oh, that's my favorite. It was good. After the credits, we cut back to Atlantis, where Calder and Lagan have been searching for Ocean Master, and civil unrest about King Orin's decisions has increased. Later, Queen Mara relates the details of a prophecy that indicates how the one true king of Atlantis will rise to power, the first part of which seems to have been fulfilled by the hooded stranger defeating Ocean Master in the last episode. Elsewhere in Atlantis, Delphis tells Calder that he needs to call his parents, and we learn a little more about Calder's complicated childhood, and Calder refuses to take a break, despite his parents' advice. 
<laughs> we need just take a break, Kelder, please. Yeah. Please rest. And at that exact moment, Child's pillar of fire from the previous arc appears in Atlantis. And back in Metropolis, because we're jumping around everywhere in this arc, uh, Phantom Girl and Chameleon Boy explain to Superman what they've been doing. They've apparently been trying to prevent the death of Superboy, which they believe they've failed at. They explain that Superboy was an inspiration to them, and to make sure that their future plays out correctly, they need Superman to take Superboy's place at a crucial moment ten years from now. (laughs) Which he agrees to do with no further information, but the fact that the Legionnaire's timeline doesn't immediately reset makes them worried they may never know whether they really fixed things, and that they just have to keep trying. Whatever that means. Back in Atlantis, the mystic crisis continues with Ocean Master arriving to apparently help this time, boosting Mera's power against the Pillar of Fire using the Trident, and out in space, Connor's fighting a ghost shark robot thing but once he calms himself and lets go of his rage it passes straight through him and continues out into space in atlantis the deadly pillar of fire is finally defeated when the mysterious hooded figure returns to help he then faces off against ocean master defeating him again and claiming the trident and orm is placed under the arrest by king orin the hooded stranger is then revealed to be arian and finally Back on land, Saturn Girl and Chameleon Boy arrive at the Garrick residence in Central City to tell Bart, Alan, they need to talk. Episode 16 begins in Happy Harbor, where McGann introduces Forager to Baby Bioship and finds out, finally, that Garfield isn't doing too great. In Poseidonus, Arian undergoes tests which prove as conclusively as they can manage that he is who he claims to be, and Arian also explains that his legendary crown was buried in the collapse of Atlantis 12,000 years ago and is likely lost forever. I'm sure that won't come up later. (laughs) Back out in ghost space or wherever he is, Connor motivates himself to keep going by envisioning McGann, cheering him on, ow, my heart, how am I supposed to process this? And in Atlantis, many people are rallying around Arian as the prophesized one true king and rioting in his name, none of which Arian wants. <laughs> and as a result of all of this, King Orin sends Calder on a secret mission to investigate some newly discovered ancient ruins in search of Arian's crown. And in Hollywood, McGann visits Garfield and tries to get him to realize how self-destructive he's being but he continues to refuse to listen to anyone. (laughs) In Atlantis, Calder assembles a covert team consisting of Wind and Lagan, but refuses Delphi's request to come along. Out in space, Connor gets some more motivational advice from a ghostly color-inverted Kid Flash and continues jumping through a field of asteroids. In Poseidonus, Orin visits Ocean Master in prison and asks about their past, but something he says makes him very suspicious and he orders Blubber to run DNA tests to determine whether this is the real Ocean Master. While he is is going to investigate the Ninth Tried criminal gang, there he finds Ocean Master's Lieutenant Danuth, and in Hollywood, McGann stages an intervention for Garfield. And while no one seems to be able to get through to him, McGann reminds him that Black Lightning made annual mental health checks mandatory for all League-associated heroes. So unless he is willing to permanently quit just about everything, Garfield is required to attend one therapy session with Black Canary. Yes, please. Yes, Finally. Yes, please. yes. Out in space, <laughs> a vision of Superman encourages Connor to keep going, but Connor fe- is feeling extremely hopeless, and that's when a vision of Match also appears and attacks Clark, snapping his neck, and Connor, overcome by what he's seen, collapses. Back in Zebel, Calder's team infiltrates the Grave of Legends and starts digging into the ruins. Delphise ends up joining their mission after following them and distracting several guards before they can be caught. But underground, a cave-in traps the group in the ruins. And back on Poseidonus, Orin discovers that the currently imprisoned Orm is actually a clone of his brother and insists that the arrival of this clone and the prophecy savior can't be coincidental. And Mera reveals that Arian has disappeared and no one knows where he went. Suspense. Ah. Three episodes to cover. Let's get into it. Okay. Superboy, are you alright? I'm fine. Feeling the aster. 
There is so much going on in these. There is so much going on in these three episodes. But I'm going to start with the thing that surprised me the most, which is that they managed to make me not dislike every minute of Lagan's screen time. <laughs> yeah. I I have not been shy to say that Lagan frustrates me in season two for many reasons. I've said them before. It's a lot to do with his character at that point in the show being very immature and kind of weirdly possessive and jealous and traits that just don't vibe well with me that just make me a little uncomfy about everything. So I am very happy with where he's at. I really enjoyed yeah. seeing his character and seeing how he's grown. Like I will 100% walk up and be like, I like this. I like that he's a better, healthier, more put together person in these episodes. That makes me happy. I don't, I never wanted him to like disappear completely. It makes me much happier to know that this character has grown and to something much better. And it's awesome that he's part of a happy, healthy poly relationship that I was, I am so, I'm so unused to seeing representation of that sort in media that it took me a second to realize what was happening when I watched oh, these yeah. episodes. I was like, oh, cool. He's, he's found somebody else. He's moved on. And then she says the line about like, my husband's over there. And I'm like, wait, I thought, and then he walks in and is like, my wife and husband uh -huh. are over there. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> like happy shocked. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. And it speaks to it. Was, it, it the no, go ahead. Go the ahead. two instances were definitely close enough to be like, hey, wait a minute. What is that? Hey, OK, there's the explanation <laughs> swimming over towards them. Uh, it's, OK, it's within like process. It's in like within 20 seconds yeah. of each other, but it's just long enough for my brain to go, wait. A oh, <laughs> oh, it was good. And it also as a as a slight. Slight mini deep dive uh, about it, because I was talking about this with other people after these episodes came out, is that I love the fact that showing Lagan in a healthy, happy poly marriage uh, works not only as like a wonderful bit of representation that we rarely get to see, especially in genre media, but is also perfect narrative shorthand to tell the audience that he's overcome some of those like immature tendencies toward jealousy and possessiveness since the only way poly relationships work is through open communication and a distinct lack of jealousy and such so you know like good on the gun for learning and growing as a person i'm very happy for him and i look forward to seeing the rest of this play out good for all of them yay good family <laughs> And they did a really good job of also like leaving like a lot of what I would say is like the essence, some of the positive essence that is Lagan. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah. his willingness to jump jump in and do the battle and become huge and do all of these things like are still there. Like it didn't there are so many aspects of the character that still exist. You don't feel like it was this total and I'm gonna use this word because we are talking about the ocean, this total sea change <laughs> of who the person was. It's still a gone, but that development has happened clearly over the years in such a positive way. Yeah. Yeah. Like the things of later in the episode, seeing that how much he like still respects Calder and thinks it's an mm -hmm. honor to be included in things and really looks up to and respects and has that loyalty of things that was very much a part of Lagan, especially that we saw like at the end of season two, it comes up a little bit like that's still there. He's just also grown as a person and I'm happy for him. What else we got? I just wanted to cover that first because it's been a very big talking point oh, with totally. these episodes. And I just want everybody to know I'm happy about it, too. How about we d briefly go into a little bit about the everything with Connor uh, about it? Because that's also another big thing that I get that this is the Calder Atlantis arc, but I need to freak out about my boy Connor for a minute because uh, how am I supposed to recover from any of this? I'm too emotionally invested in this man. Uh, but my main point is... Connor ain't dead, and I'm sticking with that until proven otherwise. Well, I think the, the big thing is, uh, like, the assumption is easily that it is the Phantom Zone, but that's not been openly stated. Yes, I keep so referring to it as strange and, ghost space no, thing. <laughs> no, and I, I think that's, and in a, lot of, in a lot of ways, I think that that's more right than say, me saying it's the Phantom Zone just because we don't know until that's true yeah. in the sense that like 
what is the version of the Phantom Zone for Earth-16? Because, you know, Greg and Brandon and the whole team put their own spin and twist on things so that it works best for the world that they've created. So then let's we can assume Phantom Girl, Phantom Zone, but at the same time, until we know, because in the same way, like, I don't know what that weird shark thing was. And I tried to look it up, but like I didn't invest a lot of time because, again, this is scream something, not deep dive. But at a curs- cursory Internet glance, I was like, I don't know what that terrifying thing was. It's a ghost robot shark thing. When I tried, yeah. I was like, what do I call it? I'm just going to break it down into its into its uh, disparate parts until it makes sense. But just all of that, well, I appreciate that they found a way to make those scenes interesting and emotionally moving when it is on the... What is literally happening in those scenes is Connor is jumping between some rocks in space over and over mm-hmm. again for an extended period of time and then he punches a robot shark <laughs> and that's all that literally happens in those scenes but the fact that we have all of yeah. these amazing things of like i genuinely started crying when connor like realizes he has to calm down and what he pictures is just like connor's perfect ideal place of happiness and calm the happy place he goes to in his mind to calm himself is just a completely normal day surrounded by his loved ones doing work he enjoys. And I just mm-hmm. started like single tear. I'm like, what? <laughs> Ow. Yeah. So good. Uh, Cause it is, it's so good. It's so simple and it's so good. Like, cause we see that trope a lot in media. And so often in media, it's like characters imagining like a genuinely very idealized place of calm. And the idea that Connor's perfect place of calm is, something he already normally has breaks my heart and is perfect and I love it. And also then just everything going on in those scenes and like the uh, the near the very end of uh, these this set of episodes, we have the moment where he's thinking about Superman trying to motivate him and be like, come on, let's get up and go. <laughs> we can do this. And then oh, yep. Matt shows up uh, and all of that. And it's so, I know we have talked a lot about like, how we feel about the violence in this season and whether or not it feels warranted sometimes and whatnot. And I thought it was interesting that this one didn't bother me partially because it was so quick compared to some of the things that have happened this season, but also that it felt really like metaphorically meaningful in the scene of stuff of like watching that happen, especially because all of Connor's dialogue with Superman is about how he feels completely hopeless and whatnot. It's this, really interesting visualization of like the idea that Connor is breaking down very close to giving up and falling into like some really dark thought patterns about how he visualizes hopelessness and also calling back to like those larger fears that we've seen since season one about like the idea that he was created as a weapon and that he is only meant for violence and things like that. So it's just a really interesting, like, literal representation of the literal worst parts of him destroying the guiding light he uses to motivate himself. And I'm like, oh, Connor's in a bad place right now. (laughs) And then he passes out about it, uh, which understand. Yeah, I love that he could see himself as Matt and like, you know, the, the literal concept in his mind that he could have that blood on his hands if he goes down that road, if he loses himself in that way. And so but. And then, like you said, it like in some ways mentally broke him and then he passes out. Yeah, it's interesting. I want that's what we got. We need to I need I need to know where he's at. But my one other thing with Connor, I got two other things with Connor real quick, and then we'll get back into Atlantis and everything happening there. I'm jumping around a little bit in my notes because I was like, let me just lump all my Connor notes together. Uh, (laughs) One, there is a. I have two references I want to bring up with the Connor things. These aren't comic book references. They're just in-universe Young Justice references. There is a moment where Superboy, after picking up Phantom Girl uh, and deciding to name her Ghosty because Connor is very literal at naming, and he Mm. makes a joke where he's like, well, at least it's better than Coma Girl and kind of moves on. And I kept going, why does that sound familiar? And then I remembered it's because... If I'm remembering correctly, I couldn't go back and completely check this one because I was working very fast on this outline. But in Disordered, 
when Artemis is having her uh, therapy session with Black Canary, she says something along the lines of, I was coma girl. I missed out on all the trauma of forgetting that it wasn't real about what happened in Failsafe. And for whatever reason, my brain was like, there's no way that we said coma girl twice in the same show. (laughs) And you thought I wasn't (laughs) going to catch this. And this may be completely coincidental, but I wanted to call it out because my brain latched onto it. The other thing that is definitely not a coincidence, and I need to point out because it literally made me say, oh my God, I get it at my screen while watching when it happened. (laughs) There is a moment in this uh, set of episodes, I think it's in the first one, where Connor to Phantom Girl says, tell you what, I'll believe you're alive if you believe I'm alive. Deal? And it's moved on and moved past. But if... Anybody remembers the credit scene from Artemis Through the Looking Glass earlier in this season. The credit scene for that one is an image of Craig, the precious genome that we love, looking at a memorial for Superboy while Artemis reads the quote from Through the Looking Glass and what Alice found there by saying, the unicorn looked dreamily at Alice and said, talk, child. Alice could not help her lips curling up into a smile as she began. Do you know, I always thought unicorns were fabulous monsters, too. I never saw one alive before. Well, now that we have seen each other, said the unicorn, if you'll believe in me, I'll believe in you. Is that a bargain? And I remember when this episode came out, me, and I think you too, and I remember me and Ariel were talking about it, we're like, what is this quote supposed to mean? What's up with this? Is this yeah. about like Cheshire or what? And now I'm like, oh, it's uh, this was a whole setup. It's for Craig. This was a whole setup so that we could get to Connor saying this like, like seven episodes later, we get the payoff for this or however many it is of just co- of like, it's good. This is why I wanted to hold off on the deep dives for stuff like this <laughs> so that this connection could oh, yeah. get made. And I'm so happy about it. I'm back on my nonsense of quoting classic literature on a superhero podcast, and I am here for it. Yes. Um, But yeah, I love it, and I want us to get in losers. We're saving Connor. I am worried about this boy. (laughs) We've flashed back through these episodes. We've gone back in time a little bit. We haven't moved forward in time that far, so we really need to get the team together and go save Connor. It was really interesting that we doubled back. I mean, it makes yeah. sense to to view what was happening, and obviously, very important things were happening. But I, it feels like one of the few times in, in the show that we've really jumped back and spent some time. Yeah, um, certainly we've ju- we've jumped back, we've jumped forward, we we've left, right, and everywhere. But it, yeah, it was one of the few times where I was like, oh, I mean, this works really well, and I kind of lost sight of that for a minute until, of course, the giant pillar of fire yeah. shows up, and I re- realized in my brain, like, oh yeah, we went back to move forward okay i'm good i had like lost track of the exact time stamps for a little bit there and then when the pillar of fire showed Mm -hmm. up i was like oh what's happening and then dr fate showed up and i went oh 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 oh, times oh i see because i just it had been a little bit since i watched the whole magic arc so i had forgotten the exact dates it's been several months of a hiatus but once it clicked i was like oh that's very cool i like this is interesting it also makes more sense when they're like when they in the magic arc when they showed up they're like ah they got it <laughs> <laughs> immediately leave uh, now they're fine. they're fine uh and before we get uh, it's totally back into atlantis i will say i do have thoughts on kid flash but we're putting them in crashing the mode <laughs> just yes. so no one goes why haven't you talked about kid flash we'll get to it i promise yes i say both Kid Flash instances yes. need to go yes. into cr- crash in the mode. We have thoughts, we promise. So speaking of Atlantis, if you want to know a little bit more about basically everyone at that conference table and that bar fight and what their vaguely referenced shared history is, if you're like, there seems to be more here, but I don't know it. Go check out uh, issues 14 and 15 of the Mm tie-in comics or listen to me and Rich break them down in our comics commentary episode about it. We'll surely dive more into those when we get to our deep dive episodes for this season. But for now, if you have questions, highly recommend those issues that introduce the teenage versions of all of those characters. (laughs) Yes. 
you're like, why are they all fighting? Why do they have problems? I'm like, well, may I point you to two issues of underwater superhero content? Well, I think that that brings up another good point that you had put down and I was going to bring it up as well, is that you can catch that Arian is in the bar seat, the algae bar scene. And actually on my rewatch, I noticed like it's he's actually the first person they show, but it's so quick that pan in that yeah. you almost don't catch it. And then he shows up a couple other times, um, which is interesting because I almost think of just like so many thoughts like why was he there what was he doing was he gonna like jump in if they, it got too far but it didn't get too far because calder punched them and then like da, 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 and it's like oh no ocean master i'll step in here that's way more fun yeah and the only reason i didn't see that my first watch through the only reason that i saw it in a rewatch was because someone mentioned it on twitter and i'm blanking on the name i'm sure that we will share that or retweet that when but when this episode comes out or something but somebody tweeted about it with like hey Look at this. And I was like, oh, my God. I there missed you are. that. Uh, and then on a rewatch, I was like, he is there. That's so out. cool. Just little little background things. What else? What else we got? You got more Atlantis thoughts or do we want to talk about Halo? Well, I have some and just the sense that like it, it's weird to have three episodes again. I guess we could take a, a quick moment to talk about that. Just in the sense that there's like, a lot, especially with the way 14 ends. And that would have been cool to have a week after I am Orm and you're like, oh, no, OK, like that's like because until that happens, like we're just assuming it is. And then like the mask comes off. You're just like, oh, wait, why? Who? How? Yeah. Week later. Yeah. You spend that know. whole episode kind of being like, well, maybe somebody else is Ocean Master now or maybe like. What? Yeah. And then you get that moment where you're like, no, that's that's him. Yeah. But he's dead. So what are we doing? <laughs> what's happening is there's more clones yeah yay the um but yeah the idea that just i, I know they were written with the idea that they would all be released individually so um that would have been great but at the same time three episodes is what it is and we watched them all and they were all great so <laughs> yeah no this arc is really fun this arc is really interesting i am looking forward to the rest of it um, but yeah and just the everything going on with i think you had some stuff about like the current political landscape of Atlantis is fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, again, because if you think about it, it's hard conceptually because you also have a single, you know, globe style map with, you know, the water prominently displayed, whereas, you know, we all look with the land prominently displayed. But the concept is very difficult because that amount of space that it represents is more than the space that we view as represented in our own world yeah, because that's 70 percent of the world and then it's all these varied people but i also feel like they did a good job of not underdoing it and not overdoing it with like explaining oh these are the ins and outs of these people blah 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 blah, blah. but letting those representatives kind of showcase the individual areas getting to know them real quickly, but then also not like dwelling on, you know, just sitting there through like a, a, thi like a what is that? A mock UN kind of thing. Yeah. I was going to say like, we don't have to, we don't have 30 minutes of bottle UN, but like you get a sense, they do a lot to very quickly be like, here is the general state of how everybody's feeling. And really all you need to know is that no one's feeling good. And the intricacies of like who's fighting with who don't super matter. And so they don't go into all of it. They just kind of be like, everybody's at each other's throat because no one's happy with how anyone is doing anything <laughs> for various reasons. And it's interesting. Yeah. I also thought it was funny on a rewatch that I noticed that the, as they're all introducing themselves, the table in front of them, like, highlights which part of the ocean they're from and yes. i did think it was funny i noticed this time through that everyone's uh border lines stop uh a, a in like a straight line above the arctic above the arctic there's just a straight line where everybody's like and there's a point where we just don't we don't the ocean stops we don't go any yep. closer to the yeah. ice it's too We're cold fine. uh and i just thought that was funny like they don't they don't no one claims that bit they're like and that's the ocean part we abandoned yep it's too cold too cold and that was just cool and fun and just atlantis looks cool all of the world building in atlantis is cool other small thing delphi's 
is fabulous and I love yes. her and I love that we're getting more of her. I love that we get to see what her powers do and that she is happily living in Atlantis and helping people and she's cool and I love that she's part of this little little group going on adventures. Well, and I love like the interaction of just like, hey, yeah, um, you're going to need to call mom and dad. Okay. Yeah. Uh, thanks. <laughs> she is little sister now. It's very cute. And then immediately, like, I, I assume we have Delphi's to thank for this. I would have called you anyways. <laughs> They're like, yeah, eventually. Uh huh. And yeah, getting that little insight into, I am, I'm so concerned for Calder in general, uh, especially with everybody finally calling out, like, hey, Woof. Calder, you never sleep. Uh, you should sleep sometimes, kind of thing. But like, getting that little insight into like Calder's childhood and getting more info on like because because nightwing says it at the start of the the first episode and all this where he's like you have always been the adult in the room and you have always been the rock that everyone leans on and that maybe isn't fair to you and calder kind of brushes it off and then we get like everyone saying it to calder throughout this arc and especially in those flashbacks of seeing like here's how you get a person who's like that and how it's not exactly anyone's fault but it's the result of complicated life and how Calder is just like, it's just who I am. And everyone's like, yes, you're wonderful. You're an amazing person. Please sleep. <laughs> Please take 10 minutes to care about yourself. Uh, and I hope he does. <laughs> I'm oh, so course. concerned for him. <laughs> yeah. And I, f- I feel like a lot of people will connect with that. And and I, cause I know I did on a lot of levels just because I also saw like, I'm an only child. It's clearly the only child that they had. And it was also one of those things where like, it wasn't until I was well into adulthood that I really realized how little money we had when we were growing up. Like there's just so many things that are explained by that. Now being an adult, having my own children and realizing like what that was, but in the same light that like, you know, the parents showed him love and he was just like, yeah, it was great. You guys, loved me like there was nobody's nobody's business but also you can see like you said he's always had to somewhat be that adult in the room and then continue like the single line that both gives world building and also makes i believe you and i much more concerned where king orin is just like yeah i know black lightning has pulled you away twice to run missions for the league and you're just like wait what it hold on in the midst of all of this you have also ran multiple league missions okay Great. Like you couldn't you couldn't get a sabbatical to be like, I'm gonna go do league business in Atlantis. Like it's not like you took a vacation. You're still working, Calder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I do as we're talking about it, I'm thinking about how these episodes do a little bit of interesting kind of parallelism between him and Garfield in certain ways. Cause a lot mm-hmm. of the Garfield thing is people being like You've passed your breaking point and you are shutting down and shutting everyone out and you have not taken the right kind of break and you have not talked to people. You have not reached out for help. And Calder is kind of the reverse side of that of like, you are going to burn out. You are going to you are pushing yourself too hard. Like you have not shut down. You're doing the opposite of shutting down. You are not taking a break. You are pushing yourself so far and everyone goes, Hey, take 10 minutes, take a day. And Cal is like, I can't, I got too much work. I got to keep going. Uh, and that is a very relatable feeling, but also please, please rest. Yeah. And also like, this is just a random thought, but I think of like the, you know, again, it's small lines that I think I end up mi- being missing from some shows where you're like that, just that one extra line could have really done this, that, and the other. Um, but the idea that like, you know, the one of the reasons that undoubtedly Calder and Wind work so well together, they're in the bar and he's like, yeah, he always orders the hard stuff. Watch out. Like, if you don't know what this is, like this, this guy over here. So with the idea of like, you know, Wind being the person to help Calder, you know, let loose sometimes or not be so serious um, was a really interesting line. And the way like I appreciate that they are showing that like Wind is the kind of partner who is constantly trying to check in on calder who doesn't just who doesn't do the thing that everybody else kind of does that's just like oh we just rely on connor as a rock and wind is like i'm gonna be the person who aggressively goes Mm -hmm. you should call your parents and take a nap because i care (laughs) about you 
And I like that. I like that about him. It's very sweet. To jump to another thing that's happening in these episodes, because so much is happening in these episodes, I really loved, I know a lot of people have talked about it online, but I really loved the scenes we got of Violet and uh, Madia in that first episode of this and everything we got to see with Halo, because just it's it was really interesting and really lovely. I, I do first want to shout out to the fact that we have now gotten official confirmation that Violet uses they them pronouns. So if you noticed in our breakdown, we're using they them pronouns for Violet from now on. And that's that's cool because I know some people discussed that last season. And like there were a couple of things I remembered, especially on rewatches in season three, even after Halo makes their speech about being non-binary and trying to figure out their gender. There are still some moments where people are like referred collectively to like, oh, yeah, the girls when Halo is there. And I'm like, no, sh- they I'm like, no, they they told you they told you that that's not. No, please. (laughs) And it's a thing that happens, but I like that this episode dealt with that more clearly and showed Halo kind of more fully exploring that and discussing that and like that little conversation between them and Harper Rowe that's just them kind of being like, okay, here's what I've figured out so far. And that feeling very honest and very sweet about like, I know I am, I am a cis lady but like I have friends who are non-binary who have had those conversations where they're like I'm not sure on everything but I'm sure on this so far and so that was very nice and then having the, how all of that and how it intersected with like the interesting conversations between Violet and Madia and how Violet feels about practicing Islam or whether or not they want to practice that and how that relates to everything of how that's not something they grew up with and not necessarily part of their identity, but was part of the identity of Gabrielle. And how do, do they respect that for because they're now in her body and all of those complicated, weird things that are like, this is both such a superhero conversation in terms of weird, complicated intersections of mm-hmm person who is an alien robot box and the resurrected body of someone who didn't have superpowers and now is full person with superpowers, but also a very normal human conversation between people discussing a faith and how a young person fits into it. And I liked that. I just liked it. Well, and one of the one of the other big things is, of course, like, well done, Zara, um, because that yeah. was two super heavy conversations. You got to have with yourself. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. All of that is there. Um, yeah. Well, the other funny thing is just like, just like when she brings it up, she, you know, you know what I want to say? Mrs. Dow is just like, yeah, you're Halo. I can <laughs> see that. It's not yeah, hard. Yeah. I watched the t- I watched the TV. It was you. Don't you. wear a mask and you were on, <laughs> and you were on uh, international television. Mm-hmm. Um, what did you think was going to happen? <laughs> but yeah, no, that was that was cool. That was nice to have somebody be like, of course I know. How was I not going to know? But yeah, no, just their entire conversation. And it's one of the things I've mentioned it before. Like, I've also loved seeing people like talk and discuss the ways in which those scenes build on stuff from the previous season. Because I know there were a lot of people who were asking questions about like, well, if Halo isn't or doesn't consider themselves to be Muslim. Why are they wearing the hijab and how that can be seen as like not respectful in a lot of ways of like, well, if you're not part of it, why are you taking that thing? And those complicated conversations surrounding it and having these characters have that conversation where Violet is like, I don't I don't know if I'm allowed to do this kind of thing and whether or not that is comfortable or allowed and all of That was just really cool to see. And I say this all as someone who has comparatively very little knowledge of any of this stuff. I am I'm a white girl who didn't grow up learning about a lot of this stuff and didn't didn't grow up like interacting with a lot of people who practiced Islam. So getting to see this in a genre cartoon is really cool and really lovely because I know that that representation is going to really matter to people who are a part of it and matters to 
people like me who are like, oh, I've never seen this. I've never gotten to see a conversation like this that explains something in a way that feels very authentic and meaningful and honest. And it's nice. I liked it, is what I say about a lot of these episodes. <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because some people definitely end up looking at those conversations in a more negative light because the idea that, like, why are these conversations happening in my superhero story? And that's an opinion that someone has. And that I'll leave that there. But the idea that these conversations are happening, I think once we get the entire season as a whole, I think there will be a broader perspective of looking at a lot of religions through the lens of Earth-16, because you also have to think about the idea that, you know, we had everything with Zatara and Zatanna. But in the same way that, like, looking at a prophecy that exists for 12,000 years, to some degree, we just look at some aspects of Atlantean religion. Because if they're following these tenets and these prophecies for so long, I think it's just a broader perspective that helps us better understand the world as a whole. And, like you said, these conversations are super, super well done more well done than i think i've ever seen just ever and they are also super meaningful for some people like these these conversations are very important to have had and i I do think it broadens the perspective of the entire show by looking into it and again doing it in such a i don't know i almost want to say reverent but in such a well done way with respect like that's that's the right word in such a respectful way and, and you know it's been illustrated online that greg brennan and the team took the extra time to find the right people to help have those conversations to ensure that yeah. they felt genuine um because again that you know it's getting those other perspectives to ensure that you do the best you can is it perfect no but like don't have that expectation you'll only be sad yeah and like my part of it i think for me looking at it is like if I grew up and did grow up in a world where like you see superheroes celebrating Christmas or whatever in a lot of stuff, I see holiday no specials. reason. Yeah. And if I grew up with that and just because that was a holiday I celebrated and thus was easy for me to understand and connect with and not question, I see no reason why other religions shouldn't be mentioned in my superhero media yeah. because they exist. They're there. Why would I ever question that existing in my superhero stuff? It belongs here just as much as anything else does. And yeah, it was just really cool to see all of that. Especially just, I've loved seeing Greg Weissman on Twitter, like calling out all of the wonderful people who have helped make these stories happen too. If anyone's interested, yes. you can, if you, it's buried in the Twitter feed, probably. Oh, but <laughs> if you scroll through Greg's stuff, Greg has often and loudly mentioned all of the wonderful people that they connected with and communicated with to make sure that they and the whole writing team were doing this right or as right as they can. No story is perfect. Nothing is ever going to be perfect. But seeing people try and put in the work to make a thing work means a lot. And I, I appreciated it, even if I am not necessarily the, I don't want to say target audience, but you know, I'm not no. I am not this group, so of course I cannot speak for this group, but from my perspective, I liked and appreciated it and liked the work that they put in. Speaking of work, speaking of work that they put in, the answer yeah. to who is Xi'an is historically that is Arian's wife. Oh. I don't know. I don't know who she is here, <laughs> but of course, <laughs> historically, uh, Lady Xi'an is the wife of Arian. So there you go. Oh, you've seen my note because one did. of my notes for this just said, who is this woman and why is she so insistent on Aaron doing something? Uh, and like I hadn't caught her name the first time and only caught it on like the second time through. I was like, oh, wait, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> but I think my my final note here before we get into some crashing the mode stuff, at least for me, is uh, Forager's graduation speech is very sweet. And I love him. I love this this big alien boy and his very sweet uh, graduation speech about <laughs> learning and growing and yes. metamorphosizing. My poopa sage. <laughs> like everything he says, sound like it's that wonderful thing that can happen in like genre media and superhero media, where a character says something that sounds so absolutely weird, but you're like, at the core of this, you're giving a very good message. Honestly, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's very sweet. I liked it. 
Uh, I also liked on a rewatch that I noticed if you stay through to the very end of the credits, uh, there is one boy at the very end of everyone cheering and yelling and just inaudible cheering. One guy just shouts, graduation. It's definitely Nolan North. hundred <laughs> percent. Because that rain, that one voice stands out so much. And it's definitely Nolan North. Oh, it gave me it gave me big vibes of like a thing that happens in theater a lot where you have some sort of scene where everybody on stage is just told just improv yep. for a bit kind of thing. Oh, you have like a big crowd uh, and there's like just make noise and inevitably someone the one person <laughs> is either in rehearsals or sometimes during a show somebody either is much louder than everyone else or doesn't stop at yep. the same moment as everyone else and you hear somebody say something where you're like that's nonsense uh <laughs> and it's like it's thematic nonsense it's just not what anyone would say and i love it it was a moment of laughing very hard at the end of this credits on a rewatch <laughs> Because it's good. It's good. It's a good little funny thing in there. So do you have anything else before we move on to Crashing the Mode? Uh, two. I have three quick things and I uh, have an order of, for them because the third one will need to just like kind of usher us into Crashing the Mode. Um, so one is that the, what do I say? Emery got connected to the Erdell Initiative. Yes, which, tell me which, things. So that's in Taos. That's the site of the Erdell Initiative, which is the Zeta Beam research that's being done on Earth. So all the research that she was. So it's possible. I mean, I'm trying to think like, you know, I, I haven't done enough research, but the idea that she was probably already connected to them to some degree. So now that she's on Earth, it's just the absolute best fit. And there you go. Uh, now you're ushered into that job. Also, d- dear Clark, they know you're Superman. What is happening? I deeply love his commitment to the bit that Clark it, is just like, nope, nope, I will. I plausible deniability. I will never admit it. Yeah. And it was just like, <laughs> oh, cool. Yeah. Tell your friend Clark. Thank you. Hi. And then also the fact that he referred to didn't say baby, but said bioship. I don't know. It was it, That was a thing. Well. Well, because the bioship that's there isn't isn't baby. The bioship that takes them to Earth is bioship. Is bioship from Mars? Wait, is I'm bio- so confused. Is- <laughs> wait, the- so wait, so like bioship is there and like he's not telling other people. I'm so apparently. Confused. I don't know. Apparently, bioship. Uh, while we're because t- it's red. It's red. And, right. It's red and black. And baby, baby bioship okay. is blue. Uh, is blue with a little bit of red and a little bit of black, but is mostly blue. So the bioship that took uh, Phantom Girl and Chameleon Boy back to Earth is is OG bioship is is our is our girl. Uh, and it's and it, it like it made me very happy. I was like, oh, she's helping. She's our girl. She's very sweet. But now, now and maybe. Who knows why why she did it or what's going on? It's just I like that their explanation is we asked for help and she said sure. Yeah. Oh, uh, because she's just also a superhero. It's very sweet. Um, yes. You know, baby bioship is in Happy Harbor. Yeah, that's why I was talking. So, okay, I it explains away my confusion. Also, technically, like when in one of the post credit scenes, you see um, Chameleon Boy and uh, why did I just space Star Phantom, Girl? Not Phantom Girl, Saturn Girl. So, yeah, you see Chameleon Boy and Saturn Girl sitting there on a park bench because Phantom Girl isn't there. Yep. And it's that park bench in Metropolis that we saw earlier. Yep. And it is presumably around this time. Again, timey, timey, wimey stuff going on. Yes. And so, so to lead us into Crashing the Mode, Batman has samples of Vandal and Cassandra Savage. Yay! Of course he does. I have thoughts about samples, but that's crashing the mode. So let's get into some crashing the mode then. Tell us something we don't know yet. Sorry, BB. We can't risk altering the time stream. We do that, we're all feeling the mode. In crashing the mode, we will be discussing potential storylines running through our heads based on the episodes released at the time of recording. This crashing the mode is based on episodes 1 through 16 and the trailer, if we feel like it. So... Do you want to get into your uh, Vandal Savage, Cassandra Savage thing first? Uh, or what do you want to do? 
we got we got thoughts. Yeah, just so that it, it, so so Batman is just apparently the league's version of Vandal with like contingency <laughs> plans on contingency plans. He just doesn't get to live as long. Um, but the <laughs> idea that he has like DNA samples of the two of them, like I said, of course he does. But it leads to a lot of questions about who. I think the easier question would be who doesn't Vandal have samples of? These have been long running questions because you have everything that's happened at Cadmus. You have like at least half the team, if not more than half of the original team, everyone that got imprisoned on the war world, everyone that ever probably. Um, so I yeah, so long term random tinfoil hats or well, you think of the missing um, the missing 16 hours or the time. So now you definitely have samples of those Justice League members, if not more. So, yeah, mm -hmm. like I said, it's easier to probably answer who he doesn't have samples of than does. But I also think of like, is that a long term solution, air quote, for battling Darkseid? It's just spin up a bunch of clones of all these people. There's my tinfoil hat. There you go. Absolute chaos. We'll see how it unfolds. Yeah. So... I got my small crashing the mode and my big crashing the mode. My small crashing the mode is uh, on my my rewatch, really noticing and paying attention to the fact that when Lagan agrees to go on the mission with Calder and Wynn, there's the whole scene of uh, him and his partners and them being like, you can't go. The, the a kid. What if what if you miss all of this and blah, blah, blah. Maybe so and soon. Has, <laughs> and all of that. Uh, and him saying, he's like, it's fine. It'll be fine. We never say goodbye. And like watching it on a rewatch, I was like, see, now I'm worried about Lagan's safety. You made me worried. I wasn't worried. And then I got worried. Like, let that boy get back to his partners and meet his kid. Please do not, uh, trope savvy foreshadow kill this fish man when I have finally started liking him. Just let him go back to his partners and meet his kid. Like he... He deserves this. I don't want him to I don't want him to die on this mission because he said that, oh, you'll I'll definitely be back. That always worries you in genre fiction. Oh, don't well, do that. Oh, what's that, Calder? You have a red shirt for me to wear? That's great. <laughs> like that's that's how it felt on a rewatch. I went, yeah. oh no. Oh no, no, you can't do this. What I want to believe is that the show is trope savvy enough to go, we put that there just to make you worried, but don't worry, it'll be fine. But what do I know? I don't know yet. People listening to this at home may already know because this episode will come out yes. the day after the, the next after. episode airs on, uh, on HBO Max. But we'll find out. <laughs> My bigger crash in the mode is so how about how about that Wally West in the in Space Ghost where uh you you notice how every vision Connor has is like in normal Technicolor except for Wally who for no apparent reason is uh the same sort of weird semi-translucent inverted color scheme as Connor and Phantom Girl and I'm sure that means nothing I'm sure that doesn't have any larger implications Wally's not dead, uh, and I haven't <laughs> believed Wally's dead. I have firmly not believed Wally's dead for at least a full season. He's the only one that looks different in this Phantom Zone thing, which makes me go, oh, that's not a hallucination or vision of any kind. That's just Wally. Wally just showed up. Just showed up. I mean, there is the version where it is Connor's con conceptual idea because he doesn't know if he's dead or not maybe heartbeats or a ghost thing is his con you know his conceptual version of wally that way because he thinks wally is dead i don't know but wally's not dead there's a i get it there's a non-zero chance the all of that but um it was just interesting and all of his language surrounding it like both of Superboy's visions of Miss Martian and Superman are like just very generally encouraging of like, you've got to keep going. You got to keep going. It's it'll be OK. You're going to get back. It'll be fine. Just you got to keep pushing through. And Wally's is far more like, hey, man, maybe we're dead, but I don't think we're supposed to stay here. Like Wally's is far more like, yeah, down to earth and is also very much more like includes himself in it too like mm -hmm. wally's not like you have to keep going he's like 
maybe we're both dead. And I'm like, <laughs> this is this is a new way of discussing this. Hello, Wally. Hello, Wally's ghost. Uh, yes. And so, yeah, it's a lot. It's a thing. I don't think Wally's dead. I think both him and Superboy are stuck in ghost space, and we got to get a magic school bus together and save both of them. Woo! I agree. Well, speaking of Kid Flash, though, what yeah. does the Legion decide to go tell Bart? Your guess is as good as mine. But these aren't the same, like, time leaps by any stretch of the imagination. Like, there's a much bigger time jump that the Legion has done than Bart has done. But also, like, are you trying to tell Bart because he's already from the future that he needs to go ensure that Superman is going to go do the thing that he needs to do? Because, like, I mean, I guess he's the one to talk to the most because he has more future knowledge than literally anyone else. (laughs) <laughs> also, where's the other person with the other time sphere? Now we know that they had one, but you know, the person in the bubble had that, you know, showed up and put the bomb. They have a time sphere, which is apparently what the Legion used, which means there's one of those still kicking around, I guess. Yeah. Your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea. Well, it just dawned on me that I, I realized that, like, the version that Bart uses is probably just the early technological version of what the Legion and, oh, the, other, yeah. and the other person, because like, like kind of conceptually and like the way they like yeah. are built is somewhat similar. Like it's the first prototype of like time travel and like it's been perfect. No, that makes perfect sense. That's a really good catch. I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're, yeah, no, I like, I can see it. I can picture them side by side now that I'm thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, the Legionnaire's plan for how do we make the future still happen is is wild. And I did, I I was joking about this on our Discord of like, they're like, when the time comes, ask yourself, what would Superboy do? And I just started listing things. I'm like, I don't know, adopt something vaguely threatening and give it a very literal name. <laughs> Hate monkeys. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Teach children the importance of regulating their emotions and having anger management in superhero training. <laughs> Protect children, respect women. What? <laughs> what you think? Obviously, we need to continue to make more merch and just have um, all kinds of stuff that says WWSBD. <laughs> Wait, is Superboy? Is Superboy one word? Did I just Superboy is one word. Oh, uh, WWSD. And we'll know. Uh, but it's just a thing where I'm like, that's, that's very, it's a little bit vague. It depends on the situation. I get that that's yeah. what you're going for, that you're like, you'll know once you're there. But I'm also like, now I'm just going to be thinking about it. <laughs> what are the general tenets of Superboy? Uh, Punch him. <laughs> no. When need be. <laughs> when need be. Yeah. Punch, but only when necessary. Yeah. If uh, fighting that robot ghost shark in ghost space taught us anything, it's that Superboy has grown a lot and is much better at knowing when it's better to be calm and not punch the ghost shark. Mm-hmm. Robot I have no idea thing. what that thing is. I, I no hope idea. It, it was so surprising. And I was just like, I don't even know what to call it. Uh, but it's great. Uh, we'll see. Other... Crash the mode things, given that we have three more letters, is basically everyone is under the assumption, mainly because it fits and like it's hard not to think about it, which also makes me think it's not true, is that <laughs> the title will spell out Neil before uh invitation to Neil before Zod. That's the collective the collective unit um belief that that is where we're gonna go with these titles. But again, as I state, because everyone is there. If I want to give credence to the idea, Zod historically does end up in the Phantom Zone a lot. That's kind of the go-to. It's a terrible way to imprison people um, outside of both time and space, permanently stuck in a terrible ghost zone. Um, But that's kind of the go-to. They see you, Zod. So maybe? We'll see. We'll see. I don't know. I was I was jokingly sticking with uh, invitation to the best wedding for a real long time there. But, you know. Probably not. <laughs> Probably won't be that. Nah. <laughs> we just take a hard left turn somewhere. Uh. The other one that I have, and I want to say I want to be 100% sure of the answer to this question, but I will ask it because I think you are also 100%. Do we think Beast Boy will quit everything or go to the Black Canary therapy session? So I think 
that it's going to be something along the lines of Beast Boy being like, uh, fine, I'll go because there's nothing wrong and I'm fine. And he'll go to the Black Canary therapy session. And, you know, then we will finally have a professional adult who will maybe get through to Beast Boy. Like, I don't think he'll happily and excitedly go to it, but no. I think he'll go to it out of like, see, I can prove that nothing's wrong kind of way. And or the... The like he's never in all of this, despite pulling back from everything, he's never talked about actually quitting the outsiders. It's a thing of like, I just need to do my self destructive thing, and then eventually I'll be fine enough to come back to stuff. So, with everybody finally laying that ultimatum down of like, hey, you have to permanently quit everything or go to therapy for one day, I think he's gonna be like, okay, fine. Uh, and go do it because I want him to. I just also just desperately want Beast Boy to go to therapy. Please, you need this. You need to talk to someone. <laughs> Please. Yes, I I agree that it'll it will happen. Like I yes, I assume as much as you do that it will happen by some way or another. Either he reluctantly goes or he just yeah. I think that's also the right choice. He's just be like, I'm gonna be fine. I'll go. No, Black Canary, gotcha. <laughs> Black Canary just stares at him long enough and is like, so uh, let's dig into any part of this. Uh, <laughs> there's so many ways we can approach this. If Disordered taught us anything, it's that you just, just let Black Canary help the children, please. I feel bad for Blue Devil. <laughs> <laughs> He's not equipped for this, but maybe no. he should be a little more equipped for it. Yep. Uh, but I appreciate that McGann got back and very early on on the agenda was sorting out Beast Boy, was big sister instincts kicking in along with school counselor instincts and McGann going, oh, let's try to sort this out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just straight up staged an intervention. But we'll see. We'll see how that and everything plays out very soon. <laughs> and with that, I think we can Zeta out of the Watchtower. Thank you for spending time with us here today. If you'd like to join us in discussing this incredible series, you can find us on Twitter at the YJ Files, on Facebook at Crashing the Mode, on Tumblr at the YJFiles.tumblr.com, on our website, CrashingTheMode.com. And if that somehow is not enough for you, you can email us at WhelmedPodcast at gmail.com. You can also find us on YouTube, Stitcher, Spotify, and iHeartRadio. And if you'd like to support our show, please consider sharing it with a friend and joining our chats on social media. You can also support the show by giving us a five-star review and or rating on Apple Podcasts or your podcatcher of choice. The ratings, comments, and subscriptions help others find the show. If you do leave us a rating, please let us know at our email address or on social media, especially if you're outside the U.S. We have to look much harder to find those. And if you are able to support us monetarily and would like to do so, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash crashing the mode. Even $1 a month can help us bring you even more awesome discussion sessions, interviews, reviews, and more. And remember, stay whelmed, everyone. You've been listening to Whelmed, the Young Justice Files podcast. Our hosts are Rich Howard and Emily Booza. Our editor and producer is Neil Powell. Our theme was composed by Emily Mio. Our logo was created by Kevin Bates. Whelmed is a fan-made podcast and is not officially affiliated with DC Comics, DC Entertainment, Warner Brothers Animation, and any other owners of Young Justice or its related source material. As such, these companies have sole ownership of all symbols, images, names, logos, and proprietary material related to Young Justice. Original content of this podcast is ours under Creative Commons. Thanks for listening, and stay whelmed.